Hello, friends. Welcome to our first online membership class. So we are putting together this uh, short series of membership class instructionals to help those who are interested in continuing to up their involvement at uh, one of the local churches where we are and make it available for as many people as possible. So let's begin becoming a member of the Free Methodist Church. So a little bit about us. You, know, you need to understand who we are, what we're about uh, before you join. Uh, we don't like to do any bait and switch. We wanna make sure that it's as clear as possible uh, so that no one can ever say, well, I didn't know, uh, because we want to enjoy this life in Christ that we're living together. So let's talk a little bit about our vision, our mission, and our process. First of all, our vision is to fulfill the great commandment. We are called to be a people who love God, love people, and make disciples. That's what we're about. If we're doing anything that doesn't fall into one of these three categories, we need to ask ourselves, why are we doing it? And this is a tall order to learn to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, to learn to love our neighbor as we love ourselves, and to make disciples who match the character of Jesus Christ. We cannot do this on our own. Only by the power of the Holy Spirit can we fulfill the great commandment. So this is our vision. This is what we're looking toward. This is what continually motivates us and encourages us and calls to us. Now, the mission, therefore, is uh, to make disciples through the Great Commission. Now, the Great Commission comes out of the Gospel of Matthew to the very end, just before Jesus uh, ascends to the right hand of the Father, he leaves his disciples uh, a task. And he tells them that they are to make disciples of all nations by going, baptizing, and teaching. Now, going means that we are not a people who just gather in one location and call it good. We have to go be around other people. We have to take the good news of Jesus and the kingdom of God to places where the good news has not been preached. And so we are a people who are called to go. We cannot make disciples unless we go. For some, that may mean going to the Balkans or going to Tanzania or going to Togo. For others, it may mean going to the same gas station over and over, or going to the same coffee shop over and over, and being with people whom you can then baptize. Now, baptism at its simplest level uh, is about bringing people into contact with water in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, symbolizing the, the in commitment to abandon old ways of life to embrace new ways of life. And we can talk about baptizing uh, a little bit later, but for now, just understand that the simplest meaning is water baptism, but it also has a very practical meaning. To baptize someone is to immerse them in the life of God. And when we go hang out with people, we are representatives of the kingdom of God. And so to immerse them in the life of God means to surround them with God's blessing. We can bless them. We can pray for them. We can encourage them. We can comfort them, mourn with them, right? So baptizing is more than just getting someone dunked in water or pouring water on their head. It's immersing them in the life of God. And we do that first and foremost by living our lives in the presence of God's life. As we go to people, and we invite them to become followers of Jesus through immersing them in the life of God, we then need to begin to teach them how to obey everything that Jesus commanded. Now, that's a tall order, right? Because Jesus commanded quite a few things, but 
The greatest command, again, is love. And if we're going to teach people to obey everything that Jesus has commanded, then we're going to need to teach them what it means to be a disciple. And so we fulfill the great commandment through the great commission as disciples of Jesus. And this is a simple, though not always easy, three-step process. Be with Jesus, learn from Jesus, become like Jesus. If we're going to obey Jesus, we have to begin by being with him. Only as we abide in Christ will the Holy Spirit be able to produce the fruit in us necessary for living as citizens of the kingdom of God. Our goal isn't to obey a new set of laws or commands. Our goal is to become the kind of people who naturally do the things Jesus would do if Jesus were living our lives. As we spend time with Jesus, we learn from him. We learn through prayer, through study, through other disciples, through sermons. Uh, and so what we learn, we then put into practice. And this is how we become like Jesus, continually surrendering our old ways of thinking and embracing what Jesus teaches as truth and putting that into practice. This is our vision, mission, and process, fulfilling the great commandment through the Great Commission as disciples of Jesus. Now, really brief history about who we are as free Methodists. B.T. Roberts is the founder of the Free Methodist Church and B.T. stands for Benjamin Titus. So B.T. Roberts uh, has a famous quote that kind of summarizes our origin and what we are about to maintain the Bible standard of Christianity and to preach the gospel to the poor. The Bible standard of Christianity. What did he mean by this? Well, as the people of God, we are uh, called to be people of one book. Now that doesn't mean you can't read any other books, but it does mean that we give priority to this book here to what it teaches, to what it says. And we believe that God's word is inspired and is useful for teaching, correcting, rebuking, and training in righteousness. Uh, and so for us to maintain the Bible standard of Christianity means that we allow scripture to fill us and to let the work of the Holy Spirit with the written word of God transform us into the kind of people who naturally obey Jesus. Now, B.T. Roberts believed that we as free Methodists had a special calling to preach the gospel to the poor. We take the love of God everywhere that we go, but like Jesus, we historically have been called uh, especially to bring good news to the poor, to the widow, the orphan, the stranger, to those whom our society would consider the outcast or the untouchables. This close identification with ministering to the poor needs to become an identification of not only ministering to the poor and with the poor, but as the poor. Blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of God. And so as free Methodists, uh, our history has been one of being people who are shaped by the written word and the living word of God, who then take that good news to the poor. In 1862, the free Methodist church formed out of the Methodist Episcopal church. Now the Methodist Episcopal church was the first uh, brand new American denomination uh, as the, the country was beginning to develop and become its own entity. And we come from the Church of England, the Anglican Church. And so as John Wesley's disciples crossed the ocean and began to plant churches 
uh, two or three church plants a day at the height of the Methodist movement, um, the, the church grew rapidly. Now, in the 1800s, uh, there was a lot of turmoil between the North and the South. And the main issue within the church was slavery. And in 1862, the small group of uh, pastors and lay leaders in the church who opposed slavery, along with a few other things, and we'll mention those, they were sent outside of the church. The church would not hear their voice. They were crying for the freedom of slaves, and the church would not uh, answer. And so they formed the Free Methodist Church. So our history has been as an abolitionist movement. We have been seeking reconciliation racially, economically, uh, and with God uh, since our inception. So that's a little bit of a history about us. Uh, if you have other questions, I'd love to talk with you about particular historical events and dates. Um, we could go on and on for quite a while. But I want to talk a little bit now about why free? We're the free Methodist church. Well, 2 Corinthians 3.17 says, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. We like to believe that the Holy Spirit is present with us and that we are free people. And if someone were to ask me, well, what's a free Methodist? I would say a free Methodist is a free person who frees people. And it doesn't matter what form of slavery or bondage we're talking about. Our goal is freedom, freedom in Christ. We have five historic freedoms. The first and arguably the, the greatest in all of our history is the freedom of race. I've already mentioned that we were formed during the time of slavery, during the time of civil war. And this is the, the freedom that we believe all races have the right to be able to worship God, that the good news of Jesus Christ and God's kingdom are available to not just white people, but to all people, and that no one should own another person. We also believe in the freedom of women. There is a large section of the church population that limits the role of women in ministry and in the life of the church. But as we read Genesis 1 and 2, and we see that God has created man and woman uh, equally in his image, uh, and we see in Genesis 2 where woman is called an azer, a help for the man. That word azer is only used of God anywhere else in scripture. So in a sense, Eve becomes Adam's salvation, helping him do what he could not do on his own. And so we believe that God calls men and women equally, and that it is God who equips and empowers both men and women for ministry. And so you'll find women clergy at, at all levels of leadership in the Free Methodist Church. We also believe in the freedom of the poor. There used to be a practice within churches of renting your pew. Today, if you come into church, you'll find everybody fills in the back rows first. It used to be everybody wanted the front row. And in fact, if you had the money, you could reserve your front row seat. It was yours. You could even lock it up. You could uh, keep your belongings there and have your own lock for a fee uh, paid on an annual basis. What this meant though, is that those who couldn't afford to pay for their own seat sat in the very back or in the balconies. And so when you walk into a church right away, you can tell just based on location, who is rich and who is poor. And so we did away with that practice. We said that the seats in God's church are to be as free as the gospel is to those who hear it. Uh, and so we try to do nothing 
that discriminates against the poor. We don't want anything to get in the way of people coming to Christ, uh, especially based on socioeconomic factors. Our fourth freedom is the freedom of laity. It's really easy for church leadership to become clergy driven. And by clergy, I mean your pastors and staff persons. Um, and so in the Free Methodist Church, the way things are structured and the way things are, are worked out uh, is there's always equal representation between clergy and laity. And that the clergy and the laity work together to accomplish the mission of the church. Uh, we are quick to empower people to do ministry. Um, and we recognize that God has gifted every member in the body of Christ, not just the pastors. And then finally, freedom of the Holy Spirit. Uh, this is particularly within the realm of worship. We do not want to dictate to the Holy Spirit what should happen in a worship service. We do not want to become so focused on the production that we miss the presence of God. Uh, we are not consumer-based worship. We want to be led by the Holy Spirit so that we can worship in spirit and in truth. So these five freedoms are why we are called free. So why Methodist? Well, the term was applied to John Wesley and his friends back in the 1700s for being so methodical in their approach to holiness. They met on a daily basis and they had a very regimented schedule. They would fast twice a week. They visited the sick. They gave alms to the poor. Uh, they read scripture together. They held one another accountable and people made fun of them for their methodical approach to holiness. And Wesley and subsequent Methodists have kind of enjoyed the term Methodist. That methodical approach proved to be an effective means of discipleship. The root of this discipleship was threefold. You had the society, which would be the large church gatherings of today. Anybody could come to a large church gathering. Anybody could come just like on Sunday morning, come to church and and hang out and worship and come to know Christ and uh, experience the body of Christ there. But the next group down were the classes. A class is what we might call a small group. It was a gathering of maybe 12 to, to 20 folks uh, who lived close to one another. And when they would meet, they would just talk about the state of their soul. How are they? How is their life with Christ? And they would uh, encourage one another and sing and uh, share in scripture. Um, and so this group really gave people a place to belong and continue to grow in Christ. And then the next strand were the bands. These were the smaller accountability groups. These groups were usually four to seven people all within the same um, stage of life. So perhaps married men with children who are middle-aged. And they would get together and they would really commit themselves to uh, pursuing Holy Spirit righteousness. They would confess their sins to one another. They would pray for one another, encourage one another. Their lives were opened to one another. They, they wouldn't hide anything. And so this methodical approach led to uh, a very healthy church. Sadly, somewhere along the way, the class meetings became voluntary, the band meetings disappeared altogether, and you begin to see the society, the local church, looking more and more like the world around it. Now, many free Methodist churches and other Methodist churches uh, are recapturing this vision of discipleship and beginning to experience new life under the leadership of the Holy Spirit. So that is a reason for celebration. Okay, so why church? Well, we are a church, not a club, not a social group. We don't gather on Sundays 
so we can see our buddies. Uh, we have a purpose as the church. The word church uh, is used to translate the Greek word ekklesia. It's not a great translation because it really comes from another Greek word altogether. But ekklesia means the called out ones. Well, if we are the ekklesia, those who are called out, what are we called out for? What is our purpose? Uh, we are called to be a faithful expression of the body of Christ. And that takes some work. Um, but that's who we are called to be. And to be church means that we find the essential direction and meaning of our life and our fellowship with God and community with Christian sisters and brothers. To be a church means my life is open to the brothers and sisters here who gather and their lives are open to me for encouragement, for correction, um, for direction, for wisdom. We share in all of this. Ecclesiastes says two are better than one because they have a good reward for their toil. For if they fall, one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him who is alone when he falls and has not another to lift him up. Again, if two lie together, they keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? And though a man might prevail against one who is alone, two will withstand him. A threefold cord is not quickly broken. So we are called to be a people who love God, love people and make disciples. And we do this by going, baptizing and teaching people to obey all that Jesus has commanded. And we have to do this as disciples, people who are committed to being with Jesus, learning from Jesus and becoming like Jesus. Thanks for joining us for this first part of our online membership class. Uh, you will see on the bottom of the screen a link to the next video that will continue the membership class. Feel free to share this, re-watch this, or send me any questions or comments you might have in regards to what we've just gone over. But until the next video, have a blessed day.